Hi, so my name is Zara Dorino, and I'm going to do a presentation for you today on neuroplasticity. So this is a very interesting topic, and it's really cool to learn about the brain and how it works. Um, if you do have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat, and I will address them at the end of the talk. And if we don't get to your questions today, because often there are a lot of questions and sometimes we don't get to all of them, there's going to be a Q&A session on September 25th at 1 p.m. So you're totally welcome to come to that. And um, any questions regarding this PowerPoint or any of the other ones that I've done on somatic experiencing or uh, rewiring your nervous system, you can ask questions at that time. And um, if you haven't seen those, they're on Dr. Arsenault's YouTube channel. So feel free to check them out as well. So a little bit about me. I have a bachelor's in psychology and neuroscience, a master's in occupational therapy. So I work as an occupational therapist and I've worked in neurological rehab for the last four years. So I work at the Surrey Neuroplasticity Clinic, which is kind of funny that the neuroplasticity is in the name of the clinic because it's a big part of what we do. And um, I also have my own clinic called Uplift Virtual Therapy. So I have um, kind of a lot of experience with long-term conditions like fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue syndrome and long COVID, and then also a lot of experience with um, concussions and traumatic brain injury and other kinds of things related to the brain, like chronic pain and neurological disorders. So that's a little bit about me. So let's talk about neuroplasticity. What is it? What does it mean? Neuro just means the brain or the nervous system. Um, and plastic means changeable. So it's the ability of our brain to form and recognize synaptic connections, uh, especially in response to learning or experience following an injury. So neuroplasticity is basically the, the ability of our nervous systems to change over time. And at one point in science, many years ago, we thought that it wasn't actually possible. We thought that the brain sort of learned when we were kids and developed its pathways and developed the things that it does. And then when we were adults, we just stopped being able to change the brain. But now we know that that's not true and that neuroplasticity goes throughout the lifetime and we can actually change our brains at any point in time. We're gonna to talk today a little bit about what can change the brain and how we can change the brain and how we can change our nervous system as well. But the important starting point for all of this is just knowing that it's possible, that we can change the brain no matter how old you are, no matter where you're at in your healing journey, there are opportunities to change and to work with the brain, which I think is very exciting because it gives us a lot of hope and ability to change things. Not that we can necessarily change it back to um, pre-injury or pre-disorder function, but we can often, you know, gain a lot of function just through the use of neuroplasticity. The way that our brains are sort of wired is functionally wired, meaning that we have um, brain cells and they, they talk to each other, right? So the more that they're in communication with each other, the more they become familiar with each other. So that's why there's a path here. Um, it's like a pathway is created in the brain. And the more you walk down a pathway, if you start bushwhacking through a forest one day, it's gonna be kind of hard. But if you walk down that pathway again and again and again, it's gonna become easier. And eventually it's gonna become like a fully formed path like this, right? Or there can be, a big event that causes that fully formed path. So, you know, a bulldozer can go through and then just like cause the path to happen. So there's kind of two ways that we can really significantly change the brain and create these pathways is either through lots and lots of repetition or through a very strong event that changes the brain. Um, but through lots and lots of repetition, the brain is always going to be changeable. So we're going to be talking about how, what that is and what that looks like. So neuroplasticity is, again, it's the way that our synapses are talking to each other. So we have a bunch of nerve cells in the brain, our neurons, and they're talking to each other through these legs on the neurons called synapses. And the synapses start to go together. So we've probably all heard the term, um, what, what, what fires together, wires together. That means that the synapses that are firing together will start to wire together to create those pathways. So neuroplasticity is achieved through intention and attention. So if we're, if we're paying attention to something and we're learning new information, your brains are neuroplastically changing right now, just learning this new information. If you're, you're, you have the intention to do something different and you're paying attention to something, that's part of the way that our brains are going to start to change. 
extreme repetition, like I said. So um, we have these receptors in the brain that help us to enhance the brain's neuroplasticity. So enhance the ability of the brain to change and they need to be stimulated by a lot of repetition. Um, once doing something once or twice isn't going to actually change the brain. It needs a lot of repetition or a highly unusual event. Like we just talked about the bulldozer event. So that's why something traumatic, um, can change the brain instantly because it's a highly unusual event and that can neuroplastically change the brain almost instantaneously because, because it overwhelms those receptors. The other way that we have to kind of work backwards from the traumatic event is to just a lot of repetition of safety, a lot of repetition of changing the thoughts around, around what happened and things like that. So that's just the example of trauma, but there's a lot of different examples that can, that can change the brain. Um, so once adapted and learned, so once the neuroplasticity takes place, it becomes a very familiar and easy task for the brain. So for example, um, just to make it super simple, if I was to show you a pattern, which you're supposed to tap your finger on the table in front of you, and you tap your finger in that pattern on the table in front of you once or twice, it's going to be, if it's a complicated enough pattern, it's going to be a little bit challenging to tap that pattern. And it's also, you're probably in a few minutes going to forget it. But if you did it 30 times in a row, your brain would start to adapt to it. It would start to change to it and you would remember that pattern. So this is how people learn instruments, right? Um, they develop this pattern of let's say playing the piano and playing certain keys and playing in a certain way. And once they understand how it all works, then their brain sort of wires together around that. And they have that for a very, very long time. It takes a while for that to be sort of burned out. Um, unless of course, you know, you don't play for maybe like 10 plus years and then, and then your brain starts to change. So you can kind of lose those patterns as well. So we can change it through repetition and then through non-use, we can also lose those patterns. Um, so there's some interesting sort of keys into what we're going to talk about a little bit more down the road. So the myth about neuroplasticity from a long time ago is that, well, not that long ago, um, in, even in the 80s and 90s, there were some scientists who thought that um, the brain wasn't changeable past a certain age. You've probably heard that saying, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. That is the saying um, that gets stuck in a lot of our minds, but it's not true. Um, we can definitely still change the brain after um, any age up until up until we pass away, we can still be working on changing the brain. So we can teach an old dog new tricks. It's just that the brain is not as plastic as we get older. So it does become harder. Yes, that's why like learning in a language or learning an instrument, these things become a lot harder as we get older, but it doesn't mean that they're not possible. So what can we change with using neuroplasticity? So pretty much anything that involves our brain and nervous system can be addressed through neuroplasticity because our, our nervous system and our brains are the things that are producing that, right? So our thoughts are one of them. If you think about it, if you think the same thought every day, several times a day for many years, it's going to be very, very easy for your brain to think that thought, right? So if you're constantly having so negative self-talk, like I'm no good, I'm never going to get better, that kind of stuff. Um, that's a thought that just becomes easier and easier to have the more that you think it. So when we're thinking about neuroplasticity and changing the thought, if we can recognize it every time we have it and say something that's like quite the opposite of that thought, um, then we can start to change it. We can start to build a different pathway that it takes instead. Another good analogy is to think about a record player. Um, and if you were to play the same song for 15 years, that divot in the record player would get much deeper. So every time you put the needle on the record, it would just slide right into that divot because, of course, um, that's a very deep divot. And it's sort of the same thing in our brains where we create these very deep divots. And it's just really easy for us to fall into them. Thought patterns, habit patterns, even symptom patterns. Um, these are things that we can kind of fall into. So neuroplasticity, changing the brain is really about picking up that needle and playing a different song. So with thoughts as an example, every time that you feel yourself 
you're about to have that negative thought or you just had that negative thought, you pick up the needle and you say a different thought instead. That's one of the examples of neuroplasticity with thoughts. Our symptoms. So for example, especially pain and tinnitus and sometimes even fatigue, we can change it by changing the brain. So by changing our habit patterns in the brain, because our brain will learn when we're in pain, for example, our brain will learn that pain. So our brain learns to be in pain even more than, um, and, and for longer than it's been in pain. Um, meaning that it's just easier for us to be in pain. Um, and it's like, because those neurons are already wired together, it's much easier for the brain to just play the song of pain or play the song of tinnitus, for example. So unlearning pain can be a part of changing the nervous system and unlearning tinnitus and things like that can be a part of changing the nervous system. Like we talked about with attention and intention, if we're constantly paying attention to our pain or our tinnitus, for example, our bodies say, oh, that person is very interested in their pain or they're very interested in the tinnitus sound. So I'm going to give you more neural connections so that you can pay attention to it even more. Our brain is basically trying to be helpful, but that's not very helpful, right? It just sensitizes us more. Basically what it does is decreases the threshold and makes the stimulus more annoying. So what we want to do is pay attention to other things. So in the same way with thoughts where we're starting to introduce thoughts that are um, you know, more helpful and healthy with our symptoms, we're starting to pay attention to symptoms that are pleasant or neutral. So while you might have pain, you probably also have somewhere in your body that feels pleasant or neutral. So usually when I talk to clients, I talk about the tip of the nose or the ears or the toes, usually places that feel um, pleasant or neutral. And so we can kind of switch away from thinking about the symptoms to thinking about something that pl that's pleasant or neutral. And that doesn't mean that we're just ignoring the symptoms or pushing them away or pretending they're not there, but we're giving equal attention to the pain and to other stimulus. And that starts again to rewire the brain away from that extra attention and extra pathways that it's given to symptoms. Same thing with feelings. So um, paying more attention, really savoring our good feelings can help to change the brain towards those good feelings. Behaviors, of course, behaviors become ingrained in us as well, right? We, we, we develop what we call habit patterns and habit patterns are really just the brain learning a pattern that, that over time becomes really easy to do. So yes, habits are hard to break, but we can use the principles of neuroplasticity to break them skills. So learning skills, every time we learn something new, we're learning with neuroplasticity, whether it's for our betterment or, or not, we are still learning through neuroplasticity to do something different. Um, so when we learn a new skill, we're using neuroplasticity and usually because, um, you know, learning a new skill, let's say you're learning a hobby, you're learning how to play an instrument that requires a whole bunch of other brain processes. So when we're learning new skills, oftentimes we're also training up other things like our memory and attention and cognition and stuff like that. We can also change cognition. So if you have memory issues, brain fog, attention, that kind of stuff, um, working your cognition. So using your memory, using your attention, using your planning and organizing skills in a very intentional way, those things can um, build up your cognitions again. Um, so there's a lot of things that we can change and that we can work on with neuroplasticity. And these are just a few that I could think of off the top of my head, but there are a lot more. So now we're going to talk about the principles of neuroplasticity so that we understand how it works and how the brain changes and sort of what it means to change the brain. So this first principle here, use it or lose it. So basically we have a, the set of connections in our brain, right? For everything that we do. And when we don't practice something for an extended period of time, the pathways for that stop, that task start to weaken. So for example, you know, if I, like when I was a kid, I used to play piano all the time. And I also could speak French fluently. Um, I am now 30 and I can't speak French anymore and nor can I play the piano very well um, because I haven't been practicing those skills. And my brain and nervous system, because I haven't been paying attention to it or practicing it, my brain has labeled it as it doesn't matter anymore. Um, 
Another example of this is that I was, for, for some of you who have seen my other lectures, you know that not only am I a clinician, but I've also been a patient before. So for a long time, I was in chronic pain uh, after an accident that I had when I was a teenager. Um, and I don't have pain anymore um, because basically I trained my brain to interpret the pain signal as meaningless. So yes, there still is a pain signal, but my brain interprets it differently. My, my brain doesn't interpret it as pain anymore. And we're doing a whole two sessions on pain in October. So if you're interested more in that, you can go to those sessions. But this is an example of if we're not using a certain part of our brain anymore, or, or we're deeming that part of our brain as it, um, the, the stimulus isn't as important, then we'll actually start to lose that neuroplasticity. So this can be a good thing or a bad thing, right? We can use that principle to help us move away from certain symptoms or thoughts or all those things that were on the last slide. Or um, sometimes it's not a good thing because when we have chronic um, conditions, we start to stop, well, we stop doing a lot of the things that we used to do, right? So um, it is important to keep our cognition. Uh, so, you know, playing brain games and, um, doing things that are kind of similar to the work that you used to do or doing some research and things like that to keep your brain sharp and keep your brain going, it's going to be really important because we can start to lose a lot of the skills if we're taking a lot of downtime. Now, of course, this has to be done in relation to pacing well and keeping within your energy envelope. But if there are certain skills or abilities or cognitions like your memory and attention and things like that that you really want to keep and you don't want to lose, then you want to think about how can I incorporate these things into my everyday life so that I don't lose these skills and abilities. Um, and it's not like they're going to be lost forever. It's just that it, it becomes harder over time, right? So you want to maintain those connections, even if it's just doing something for two, three minutes a day to maintain that connection, it's going to be really important to do. And this is why um, sort of graded exposure to activities, and I'm not talking about graded exercise because that is contraindicated for people with chronic fatigue syndrome, but graded exposure to activities where you're slowly introducing yourself to things you used to do, like whatever it was, knitting, or um, maybe you did a lot of Excel spreadsheets for your work, something like that, where you do little bits of it will help you to not lose those connections in your brain, even if you're just doing it a little bit. Um, specificity. So you have to train your brain in very specific ways. Um, basically this will help to increase the connections of the brain. So there's kind of two important aspects of this. One is that with specificity, if you want to um, keep a skill or you want to learn a new skill, you have to do that exact skill. It is not, it's not going to be helpful to do something. It, it might be slightly helpful to do something adjacent to that skill, but you really want to get as close to it as possible. So if you, um, you know, you're like, well, I used to be an accountant. So now I'm doing Sudoku puzzles to keep up with my, my, um, you know, my math, not exactly math, but like my number skills, then it's, it's kind of similar and you're working out similar parts of the brain. But really, if you used to be accountant and you want to keep up your math skills, you got to work on math, right? Or, or things that were similar to your work. So specificity is important. Um, and it's also important to um, like trick the brain or, or challenge the brain with learning things that you haven't tried yet. So one of the things that's just very, very good for our brains is trying to learn a new skill. Um, so that can feel very overwhelming if you have a long-term um, condition and it might be a good idea to focus on the skills that you want to retain. Um, but, you know, trying something new, maybe maybe thinking about a language that you could learn or um, thinking about, you know, a different skill, maybe cooking or something related to literally any hobby that you're interested in, but giving your brain a little bit of uh, a little bit of brain candy by teaching it something because our brains are very eager to learn. So that's another kind of concept to keep in mind. So using it and you improve it, right? So we talked about this a lot. When you practice something, those connections become stronger. So you train a thought or a behavior, you do it regularly, and then you can have much more speed, much more performance. You can, um, you can gain aptitude in that skill. So if you do something over and over, you're going to 
you're going to improve it. That's just kind of how the brain works. Again, it's really important when you're dealing with any chronic conditions to do it gradually and to make sure that you're not pushing yourself too much so that you're kind of going into your red zone and crashing. Um, so when we're using the principles of neuroplasticity, we, we have to use them within the context of whatever uh, condition you're dealing with as well. So age, we talked about this a little bit already. Our brains are most flexible and adaptive when we are young. You'll see kids pick up things so quickly. Um, and that's because our brains are growing and they're figuring out what, like how to learn and they're figuring out what kinds of things they're going to cut out, what kinds of things they want to keep. But keep in mind, your brain can grow at any age. Um, and there are different things we can do to stimulate our neuroplasticity when we're older, which we're going to talk about. Salience. <clears throat> so our emotions are going to affect the strength of memory consolidation, which means that if something is important to us, we're going to remember it a lot more. If something means a lot to us, then we're going to do it more, meaning that we're going to have that repetition happening, which creates the neuroplasticity. And also because it's more important to us, our brain is putting a lot more attention there. And like we talked about, there's that attention and the intention, those two things together create neuroplasticity and repetition. So <clears throat> the salience means that you choose activities that you actually want to do that are actually important to you. And as an occupational therapist, this is where my passion shines because meaningful activity is so important to rehab. You can't just sit there and do a bunch of exercises you don't want to do. Yes, of course, you know, sometimes you just have to do your phys physio exercises to strengthen certain muscles, but is there a way you can make it more meaningful? Is there a way you can make it more fun? You know, could you do it with a friend? Could you do it with music on? Could you do it and have a reward after? Um, and making things important to you and thinking about, okay, when you're thinking about neuroplasticity and what you want to change, really choosing the skills and the thoughts and the, the, the shifts in your life that would be most important to you and most meaningful to you, because that's where the most meaningful change is going to come from. If someone's like, you should pick up an instrument and you're like, I don't like music. I, I'm not, you know, musically inclined and I don't want to, then trying to learn piano is going to be like pulling a tooth, right? It's not going to be fun. So the salience, the emotional thing is going to be very, very important. Um, so time. <clears throat> so if therapy uh, targets are changing, increasing and strengthening the pathways in your brain, it should work anytime. However, there are windows of time where progress happens at a faster rate. So, you know, like um, there's a couple of different ways in which time plays into neuroplasticity. One is the age thing. One is um, when you're doing activities. So we're going to talk in a little bit about ways to optimize neuroplasticity, but one of them is working out. Um, it's hard to work out when you have a chronic condition, but even if you're just doing whatever you can within your energy envelope to get your heart rate up a little bit, to move your body a little bit, and then you're learning new information that's going to help you hold on to that information better because we're, um, you know, increasing blood flow and all that to the brain. And we're increasing what's called brain derived neurotrophic factor or BDNF. And that helps increase neuroplasticity. Um, so there are going to be times that are optimal for training and also thinking about when do you have the most energy for training? You know, is it first thing in the morning? Is it in the afternoon? Is it before bed? there's going to be optimal times to do your training that are going to make the most sense for you and your body and your brain. Repetition. You've heard me say this a thousand times. That is intentional. <laughs> I've said repetition so many times because I'm repeating it so that you'll remember it because repetition, attention, and intention are the three most important things I think for, neuro for uh, neuroplasticity. So repetition, repetition, repetition. <laughs> um, we have to have it for long-term changes in the brain. Thousands of repetitions. I'm not just saying one, right? So a lot of my clients will come to me and they'll be like, well, I tried your nervous system regulation techniques and they didn't work. And I'll say, okay, well, you know, A, it's been a week. So of course not. And B, even if you did it every day, 10 times a day within this week, that's still only 70 times. And that's not enough right? It, think about how long it took your brain to get to the point where it is now, or how serious of a, an event it took to get your brain to the point where it is now with whatever symptoms you're managing or thoughts you're managing. 
it's going to take a long time to get out of there. It doesn't mean it's impossible, but it does mean that persistence and dedication and like <laughs> I'll say it again, repetition is really, really important, right? You're not going to pick up a piano and expect to play it within a week. Um, or do a sport and expect to just be like the best at that sport within one week, right? So when we're thinking about changing our nervous system and changing our brain, we really have to consider this is going to take time. This is going to be an investment in myself and in my brain and really working with your brain to continue to get returns on that investment so that you can actually dedicate to it. You know, you're not going to go to the gym twice a week and then expect to be, you know, a bodybuilder. So it's the same kind of principle there. Um, transference. So while I said that specificity is important, so doing things that are exactly what you want to change, there is some transference that can happen. So learning in one situation like therapy can generalize to other situations like social settings. Um, and training a specific skill can sometimes activate the pathways of nearby untrained items. So sometimes what we find when we're training one area in the brain is that others will follow. Um, so for, I mean, a very simple example of this is like, you know, if you're training um, with fine motor skills, like maybe you're uh, someone had a stroke and they're training how to type again on a computer that might also translate into their ability to write because they're working on the fine motor skills in their fingers. Um, so there can be transference when we're working on things. So that means that, you know, if you're working on one area of your brain, congratulations, you're also working on other areas of your brain. You still want to have that specificity if there's like specific goals that you have so that you can actually work towards those goals. The intensity is important. It is so common as humans to do things that don't challenge, that don't challenge yourself. What I find with a lot of my clients is they're so scared of their symptoms that they don't even slightly poke the bear, right? They stay in the green zone where they have very minimal symptoms or they're kind of just managing the symptoms that they do have and they don't do anything that spikes their symptoms. It's going to be very important that we push beyond that a little bit. So we don't want to go into the red zone. The red zone means a full crash. We want to go where we're kind of like increasing our symptoms by one or two points. So if you're on a 10 point scale and you start at a six, you want to increase your symptoms one or two points, maybe it was seven or eight in intensity, right? When you're, when you're working with changing your brain, you need it to be challenging. And we call it the just right challenge. So it's one step above your current level. So for example, um, you know, if, you, if you're like lifting at the gym, you don't want to go and be like, okay, well, Zara said I need to challenge myself. I'm going to lift 100 pounds. No, if you're currently lifting 10, then next week, if you can do, you know, um, 10 perfect, nice form reps, at 10 pounds, the next week you try to do 12, right? And I'm not a physio, nor am I a kinesiologist. So I don't work specifically one-on-one -on -one with, um, with like weightlifting and stuff. It's just an example of increasing intensity. Um, but yeah, we want to do it slowly and gradually, but it has to be challenging. It has to be at least a little bit challenging, or there's not going to be any growth. Interference. So the brain is always learning, but it doesn't really know the difference between good and bad. So this is a, this is a thing that's important to think about. You know, if you go and you do your therapy exercises with your counselor or your OT, and, and I'm talking right now about mental exercises. So let's say, you know, you have anxiety or depression and you go and you do your thought challenges with your counselor or your OT, and you're working on you know, being kinder to yourself and creating empathy and self-compassion and these kinds of things. If the rest of the week you're shaming yourself and talking horribly to yourself and, and, and saying a bunch of really mean things in your head, that's going to interfere with the neuroplasticity of change that's happening in your sessions. It's the same thing as when, you know, um, if I ate really, really healthy one day and the rest of the week, I was eating very poorly. 
that's not it's they're good they're in conflict right so we can't just do some good things sometimes and then not do other good things at other times so it's also really important to think about your habit patterns and the ways in which your brain and your nervous system are already forming habits and see if we can boost it so that most of the time we're working towards a, pl a neuroplastic change that we really want to move towards. Um, another good example of maladaptive habits is like, for example, with the chronic pain stuff, a lot of times what happens is that people will adapt um, compensatory behaviors. And what that means is that they might um, clench a bunch of muscles that they don't need to clench when they're reaching for something on a shelf or make a bunch of um, like pain faces um, when when they get up from, from seated or something like that. So we learn these behaviors over time that kind of become ingrained. And those are maladaptive habits because what it means is that we're basically creating more pain in those situations than is actually needed for that situation. So practicing the wrong things or developing bad habits can actually create bad neuroplasticity, right? So um, there's good neuroplasticity or helpful neuroplasticity where it's moving our brain in a change that we want. And then there's bad neuroplasticity where something happens or we repeat a pattern over and over where it's actually changing our brain in a way that we don't want. Um, so we can really go both ways, right? And we've all probably been privy to a moment in our life where something really big happens and it really changes the way that we think about things, either for the good or for the bad. And so that's a, an example of a, a big moment causing that neuroplastic change. Repetition matters again. So I'm just saying it again because it's very, very important. Okay, so some of the consequences of neuroplasticity. So we talked about these compensatory behaviors that we can have. So compensatory just means we're compensating for something. Um, I talked about it in the realm of chronic pain, but if we think about compensatory behaviors in the realm of um, strokes, uh, sometimes people are recovering from a stroke and they might learn how to use their muscles in the wrong way. Um, or, you know, a compensatory behavior psychologically is, for example, um, you know, if somebody's parent was always very argumentative, their compensatory behavior that they may have learned is just to shut down and not, not argue back. And that's sort of how their brain formed. So we can neuroplastically learn these compensatory behaviors, and that becomes a neuroplastic change that we didn't want, which, you know, can be bad. Increase in bad habits. We all have bad habits, every single one of us. And if it's a habit, that means there's been a neuroplastic change because a habit is something that's really easy to do. Neuroplasticity, when we've changed our brain with neuroplasticity, it means that it's very easy to fall into that um, divot like we talked about earlier, right? So a habit is literally just a neuroplastic change. Um, <clears throat> so we can change our habits and change our brains as well in the process with neuroplasticity. The promotion of negative brain changes. So again, that's what we've been talking about. And then the learn non-use is what we've been talking about as well with where if you don't do something, mm -hmm. then you learn your brain just kind of forgets how to do it. That's important. The learn non-use is really important when we're thinking about return to work. So if you're not on long-term disability and you are considering a return to work, it's important like as soon as possible to start to think about things that are kind of similar to work that you could engage your brain with. So it doesn't have to be that you're like fully going back to work or thinking about it. It could literally be five minutes of looking at old things related to work. But the idea is that the sooner that we start thinking about work, the, the more that we're going to be able to retain some of those um, skills and the things related to work. So that, that can kind of play into that learned non-use. The power of being bored. So one of the things that can really help us to improve our neuroplasticity is actually just to be bored. And I, that might sound a little weird. Um, and by being bored, I mean, I don't mean listening to a boring lecture. Maybe you're bored right now. That's not the kind of boredom that I mean. Um, I mean, being bored in a way that is, you're not really doing anything and you're bored. Your brain's like, what do I do? Because when we're bored, we become more creative 
and more flexible. When we're bored, there's a part of our mind called the default mode network that kicks in. And when that mode kicks in and we're not in the other mode called the executive network, our brain is gonna be creative and it's gonna have these interesting ideas. If we think of um, shower thoughts, that idea of like, oh, I had this interesting thought in the shower. That's because our, our we're doing something that's sort of um, robotic at this point. We've done it so many times and our brain shuts off and goes into being bored. And then it creates these, these interesting thoughts that we can have. Um, mm -hmm. So when we're bored, that can increase our neuroplasticity. Um, so that's something to think about. And also thinking about flow. So I'm not sure if you've heard of the concept of flow before, but the concept is that um, you're so engaged in something and you're so interested in something that you sort of lose track of time and your brain goes again into this default mode network where you don't even really have to focus on what you're doing because it's like, it's just so interesting. So if you can think of anything in your life that puts you into flow, that is also really good for stimulating the brain and stimulating that neuroplasticity. So either being really bored, doing nothing or doing something that is so interesting that it's literally like enrapturing, like it's capturing all of your attention, all of your interest, and you're just lost in that activity. Those two things can be very, very good for stimulating that neuroplasticity and, and allowing the brain to change. Some other things that we want to consider when we're considering neuroplasticity and changing the brain. So getting proper sleep. Um, I know for a lot of people out there, it's really hard to get proper sleep. Maintaining really good sleep hygiene is important. So, you know, not having bright lights before bed, including overhead lights, um, making sure that you're not eating a big meal before bed, taking, taking care to do a nice nighttime routine ritual. So like maybe reading a book or taking a bath or um, journaling or meditating, these kinds of things will help to maintain that proper sleep. Um, and also it's recommended not really to nap after 3 p.m. if you want to get some good sleep. But I know when you have chronic fatigue or long COVID or th those kinds of things, it's hard not to nap, right? You, you, your brain really wants that napping. Um, but one thing that you can do if, if you care to try in the afternoon, if you um, feel like you want to experiment with not napping is to do something called a non-sleep deep rest or a yoga nidra. Uh, non-sleep deep rest is going to help you to get some very deep restorative rest. It's, it's a meditation. It'll help you get some deep restorative rest in the afternoon without actually sleeping. Um, and that can be really good for also improving the neuroplasticity part of things too. A yoga nidra is also a meditation that's kind of similar to sleep and you might even fall asleep, but um, it gives your mind that ability to rest without actually sleeping. And if you set a little timer at the end, then that can, that can be your sort of afternoon recharge rather than a nap. But then again, some people just need, really need that nap and that's okay too. Learn a new skill or practice an old one. So that's what we talked about before is that when we're learning something new, we're really engaging the brain. We're turning on that neuroplasticity. So that can affect other things as well. Meditating. So we just talked about that as a afternoon option, but just incorporating meditating into your day. Um, ideally, like you know, every day, if possible, that can really help to start to change the brain because there's a lot of things going on with meditating. We're putting our brain into an alpha state. So we're putting our brain into a relaxed, slow brainwave state, which is a really good state for the nervous system and the brain to be in. We're also practicing our focus. So for people with brain fog, when you're meditating, you're honing your focus. You're really training your brain to focus on one object, one thing, and that can really help to reduce brain fog. Um, exercise, again, we talked about exercise and how you gotta be careful and kind of find your right amount for your energy envelope. Socializing well. So being social is incredibly good for our brains. Our brains need it, we're social creatures, right? And um, when we're engaging with other people, there's all kinds of um, hormones and, and brain chemicals that are released that are important for 
keeping the brain healthy and for changing the brain. I know it can be hard to socialize again when you have chronic conditions. However, it's, it's really important to maintain some kind of socializing, even if it's just being a part of a group chat or, you know, having other friends with chronic conditions that you can chat with and talk to about what you're experiencing, um, doing whatever small social events that you can muster. Those kinds of things are going to be really important for keeping the brain healthy and well. Eating well, we talked a lot about that last week on the neuroinflammation podcast or uh, chat. Um, some supplements to support the brain. You can chat with your doctor about that. And also we talked about some supplements last week in the neuroinflammation, which is on the YouTube channel. Potential for other therapies for neuroplasticity. So there is some interesting research coming out. It's not legal yet. So um, it is just in the research phases, unfortunately. So keep your eye out for when it does become legal and when there is, you know, trained therapist offering this, because I don't think it should be done on your own at all. I think you need to do it with a trained therapist, but there is interesting research coming out in the fields um, of psychedelic assisted therapies. So psilocybin or ketamine, um, and how quickly those substances can put the brain into a state of neuroplasticity. Again, the psilocybin and the ketamine will activate that default mode network where you have an opportunity to look at things in your life, your symptoms, your thoughts, your feelings in a removed different way and sort of an objective sort of way. Meditating can do this as well. This is just, you know, a little bit more of a condensed experience but psilocybin or ketamine assisted with a therapist present, a trained therapist. You can maybe look into people who are offering research at this time. Um, and in the future, I, I think it's going to become, you know, it, it looks like it's going to become legalized and, and something that's going to be accessible. And ketamine therapies are already accessible. Um, they're just quite expensive at the moment. But these therapies are possible and accessible if you're looking for other ways to um, speed up the changes in the brain. So we talked a bit about attention and pendulation is a concept that we talked about in the somatic experiencing PowerPoint, but this is also a great way to think about neuroplasticity because when I talk about changing our symptoms and, and paying attention to good and positive things, a lot of my clients assume that what I'm saying is that we should ignore things and that we should just like pretend our symptoms don't exist. That is not at all what I'm saying. What we are saying is that we're noticing the pain or the thoughts or the symptoms and we're observing them objectively. So we're trying not to get lost in like the story behind the pain and the symptoms. We're observing it objectively, but then we're also noticing somewhere that is neutral or pleasant. If you can imagine that I'm looking at my world through a pinhole and I'm kind of just looking around at everything through this tiny little pinhole, and I maybe I fix my pinhole on all the negative things that are happening in the world and all the negative things that are happening in my body and my own system. That is my viewpoint. That is my, that is the way my brain has formed. That is my functioning. That's how I, I work. If I open the aperture and I'm looking at everything else around, not just the pain, then I'm also, I'm having a more full experience, right? So the idea is that we're pendulating between the two. We're moving from noticing the unpleasant experience to noticing a pleasant experience or a neutral experience because sometimes it's hard to access pleasant ones or you can create a pleasant experience. You can have a hot chocolate or you can, you know, um, snuggle up a, a dog or something like that. And then you have a pleasant experience that you can really notice, but just kind of going between noticing the unpleasant, noticing the pleasant and switching between the two, this will open up the attention and we, we pay attention to different things. If we pay attention much more to things that are neutral or pleasant, things that we're grateful for, things that we love, our glimmers, like we talked about in the nervous system regulation PowerPoint, if we pay attention to these good things, our brain will want to pay attention to them more because the brain says, oh, you're interested in finding gratitude great, I'm going to give you more neural connections to find gratitude. Oh, you're interested in the fact that your body feels actually really good in some places, or it feels really neutral in some places. I'm going to give you more brain capacity so that you can pay attention to that even more. That's the idea behind pendulation. That's an exercise you could even start trying today. Replacing our thoughts, so like we talked about earlier, 
every time you have a negative thought come up, notice what they are, catch them, try and try and notice, oh, that's, that's a negative thought that I'm having. You could even imagine that it's coming from a, a source outside of yourself. You could label your thoughts as like, you know, negative Nancy or whatever. If you don't know someone named Nancy, um, then you could label your thoughts a certain name and just say, oh, negative Nancy is, talk is talking to me again, you know, or, oh, this, this thought pattern has come up again. Um, and you're recognizing that you've had that negative thought. And instead, you can replace it with a coping statement that you repeat to yourself. What is interesting is that our brain has something called the negativity bias. So our brain is going to be much more focused on negative. So what you want to do is for every negative thought you, ca you catch, say the coping statement. So, you know, if your negative thought is I'm not good enough, your coping statement is I am good enough or I am doing my best. And then you say it three times. I'm doing my best. I'm doing my best. I'm doing my best. Because this is sort of similar in, in relationship therapy. They say that for every like one negative comment you say to your partner, um, there should be 20 positive things that you say um, if, in order to keep the balance, which seems like a lot. But I mean, positive statements can be um, like something as simple as a positive bid for attention. Like, wow, look at that beautiful cloud and sharing that moment together. So I just said three times, so it doesn't feel overwhelming, but as many times as you can, saying something positive or neutral will help to replace that negative thought. But it has to be more times than the negative thought because of the negativity bias and how our brains are just wired to seek the negative. Like you've probably had this experience where maybe if you ever got a review on something or like you looked at your grades for something and you have you know 20 good reviews and one bad review, you will forget everything lovely said about you in those 20 good reviews and you will fixate on the one bad review because of the negativity bias. So it's important that we increase the amount of positive coping things that we say to ourselves. When we were, are talking about reducing the activity in the amygdala, so the fear center of our brain, and last week, or perhaps the week before, we were talking about rewiring the nervous system, and we were talking about how we can slowly start to bring down the fear in the body. And when we bring down the fear, it can bring down lots of symptoms, because our amygdala controls all of our um, survival responses. So it controls our fight, which is our anger, our flight, which is our anxiety, our freeze, which is our sadness and numbness and um, fatigue, and our fawn, which is our people pleasing and codependency. So if we can soothe this part of the brain, we can neuroplastically change it so that there's less activity in the amygdala. Because for people who have a dysregulated nervous system, there's more activity in the amygdala. Neuroplastically, there's more connections going to the amygdala. So if we can actually feel a sense of safety and a sense of peace, so kind of asking yourself, what helps me to feel a sense of safety and a sense of peace? And a lot of people, when I chat with them in the beginning, they say, well, nothing. And I guarantee you that's not true. There's something out there that in the presence of it or thinking about it or consuming it, you would feel peaceful. So, you know, like for consuming, what I mean is like a hot chocolate or mint or something that helps you to just kind of soothe, calm down. Um, you know, for me, no matter what kind of bad state I'm in, if I see a sweet, cute animal, and especially if I get to cuddle it, I will feel better. Um, at least like a smidgen better. Like I'm not going to say it's going to erase grief or something like that, but it will definitely at least increase my sense of safety, my sense of peace, my sense of gratitude 1%, you know? And if we can just move that dial even a little bit, sometimes we can really um, start to create that sense of peace even more. It's like a snowball. It will just keep rolling down that hill and collecting and collecting. So when we're thinking about rewiring the nervous system, we really want to create a sense of peace as often as we can. We wanna get into that flow state as often as we can. We wanna do activities that are meaningful and important as often as we can. The nervous system regulation techniques, again, you can review the slides um, or the presentation um, from the rewiring your nervous system, but there's breathing exercises, there's eye exercises, there's cold exposure, there's a lot of things we went over that can help 
bring your nervous system back into that sense of safety and peace. And that will rewire your brain and change the neuroplasticity in your brain to a more safe nervous system. When the nervous system is more safe, you don't have those fight, or, those fight flight, freeze, fawn symptoms. So it's a win-win with changing the brain. So some other things in terms of feelings of safety and connection. So glimmers, we talked about those in the rewiring your nervous system as well. Glimmers are the things that help you to feel safe and good, and they can be lots of different things. You can make a list of your glimmers. You can look up more about glimmers. There's a hundred podcasts about it. There's books about it. Um, if you Google glimmers, you can find out a lot more. You can imagine positive things because our, um, our thinking, our imaginative brain is so powerful. And when we imagine positive things, even if you're imagining something completely not true, like you're imagining that, I don't know, Falcor, that big dog dragon from the never ending story is like wrapping you up in his, in his dragon body and, and snuggling you, like that could be a positive thing that you're imagining and that could make you feel safe. Or maybe you're riding on his back through the sky and, and that makes you feel safe and good and, and positive. Whatever it is, you can come up with the wildest thing. As long as it's positive and it makes you feel safe, makes you feel good, then imagine away anything you want. It could be spiritual, religious, anything. It's very powerful to imagine things with with your mind. So that's a really good technique for changing the mind. When we look at people who play sports, a lot of people will imagine themselves winning the goal or, um, you know, they'll imagine their body mechanics being perfect to, um, to get the most points in their game. And it actually improves their score and it improves their ability in their game. So by imagining yourself, in any way that you want to change your brain, whatever you're working on, imagining yourself doing back at work and doing a great job at work or imagining yourself um, back doing your hobbies. It could be painful to imagine that sometimes because we're imagining things that we really want, but it can also be good because it's pushing us in that direction, which is you know the direction we wanna go into. It's also really important to savor the good. You know, when we're chronically ill, um, it, there can be a few good moments sometimes, like some weeks are just really bad, but if you do find the good moments and you savor them and you really enjoy them and you're like, yes, this is amazing. I love this. And you take time to really savor it. That will help your nervous system to want to do that again. It's important to know that you might not be able to neuroplastically change your brain so much that you get rid of all your symptoms but you can change how you relate to them. Like I said, my pain is still there, but it doesn't bother me. It doesn't affect me. I can do absolutely everything that I used to be able to do and more. Um, and I'm building strength every single day, but yeah, there's pain there. It's just, I don't relate to it in the same way. I don't interpret it as a, like a, a negative signal. And that you're not going to be able to do that with all of your symptoms, obviously like fatigue is a whole different beast. Um, but we could change the way we relate to them. And when there's less of an emotional component to our symptoms, often they're less intense, right? Um, if we have fatigue and we're also depressed on top of that, we're also anxious on top of that, you know, as somebody who experiences fatigue, that that can make it infinitely worse. So we, we might not be able to change the actual symptom. We can lessen it sometimes. We can't necessarily get rid of it, but we can lessen it. And we can change how we relate to it. So it's important to think that this is not like a cure for everything, um, but it is a way to, to work with our brains differently. So just some uh, final little tips and tricks. Focus on one task at a time. So focus on one thing that you want to change. Get really clear on what you want to change and define it really well. You could make a list for yourself of 10 things that you really wanna work on and work on them one at a time or a few at a time so that your brain really has a chance to, to do it. If you try and juggle with six balls at once, when you're learning, you're gonna drop them all, right? So learn one, then another, then another, and then make sure you feel very confident in the skills and the things that you're trying to change before you add another one in so that your brain has um, the ability to actually work with it. Make a routine with your new habits. So, you know, it's easy enough to be like, I'm changing my diet. And then you do it for 
three months and then you fall off, right? So you really want to make it a routine and something that's achievable and easy enough to keep going in your life where it's not something that's just going to kind of fall off, right? Again, challenge yourself, but build slowly, especially, especially if you have long COVID or chronic fatigue syndrome, please build slowly, slower than you think. Um, break things down even more than you think you have to. That's going to really help you have success over time. Other treatment options. So neurofeedback is a really good way of getting into the brain and changing it from the level of the brain. Neurofeedback is a device that you put on your head and it reads your brain waves and then it feeds back to you in real time, whether you're in an optimal, like relaxed, calm state or not. And it helps train your brain to be more calm. So it can help with reducing anxiety and reducing pain, reducing fatigue, helping with attention, helping reduce brain fog, those kinds of things. So neurofeedback is something that is really powerful because it works from the, the actual level of the brain. And I'm going to give you a link to the website uh, for the neuroplasticity clinic where I work, the Surrey Neuroplasticity Clinic. So you can look at the website and you can take a look. And if you want to do neurofeedback, that's something you can do as well. Clinical hypnosis is also something that I offer as a clinician. Um, it is basically a way of soothing the brain, calming it right down so we can work with the subconscious. And when we're working with the subconscious brain, we're able to change subconscious thoughts and beliefs and habit patterns. So that's a way of changing the brain, again, sort of from the inside out from the subconscious, because some, sometimes our conscious brain and our subconscious brain are in conflict with each other. Um, massage is a, rate, a really good way to just soothe the nervous system, acupuncture, EMDR, so eye movement desensitization, reprocessing therapy. I am not allowed to do that because I'm not a counselor. You have to be a certified counselor to do that. I'm an occupational therapist. Um, so, but that is very, if, if you have trauma and that you think that your trauma is related to these things that are going on in your nervous system, definitely look at into uh, EMDR or CPT, um, which is cogn uh, cognitive processing therapy, I think. Um, they're both really great trauma therapies. Um, and vagus nerve stimulation is also something you can chat with your doctor about. I wouldn't recommend buying a device on your own. It's a bit too sketchy to, to do that on your own. So thank you so much for listening. Um, this is my TikTok and my Instagram if you want to take a look and see more about what I do. Um, and there's lots of free tips on there. My website is here, which you can also see more about what I do. And like I was talking, if you are interested in the neurofeedback, you can check out the Surrey Neuroplasticity Clinic website. You can also send me an email. Um, I'm going on vacation for the next three weeks, so I might not respond right away. And my, my, my current private practice is full. And um, the course that I'm doing in the fall is full as well. So I'm going to be launching more courses and I also have a wait list. So you're welcome to email me and ask to be put on the wait list. And we could potentially get you in either at the clinic or at my personal clinic. Um, but yeah, if you want to work with me, email me, we'll get you on a wait list and um, stay tuned over the next month or so. I'm going to be releasing more courses and, and group classes like laughter yoga. And I'll do a group hypnosis and I'll do um, you know, more courses that are a little bit more in depth than what I'm offering here. Uh, and those are going to be very cheap, like $15 a class. Uh, so yeah, I'll open it up now for questions. Um, let me just take a sip of water first. Okay. So what is the link for the YouTube channel? Um, Dr. Arsena, what is, what is your YouTube channel called again? Oh, uh, Dr. Rick Arsenal. Just Dr. Rick Arsenal. I thought it was some it is, clever, it was like a clever play on words with MECFS. It's called METV, but ah. if you just put YouTube slash at Dr. Rick Arsenal, but the easiest way is probably just go to my website. It's one of the top links. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much. Can there be strong positive events as well as traumatic ones that change the brain? Example, would psychedelics be in this category? Yeah, hundred um, percent. Definitely a strong positive event, especially, um, you know, if someone does have trauma, but then they also have like a very strong 
um, personal bond that feels very safe that can be very protective, right? So that's why, you know, something might be traumatizing for one person that's not for someone else. And certainly um, something extremely positive can change the brain in, in a very positive way. Um, it's just a little bit more uh, rare that we have something so euphoric and extremely positive that it would change the brain. But yeah, psychedelics would be in that category for sure, for some people and under the guidance of a therapist. Um, would it work for essential tremor, general spasticity? Um, it, it highly depends, um, on the cause of the tremor, um, and general spasticity. Sometimes that, that can be changed. Um, I like to be pretty optimistic with neuroplasticity that we can change a lot of things and that we want to try. Um, I'm not exactly sure with, with tremors, just because there's like a biological underpinning of, um, usually uh, a disruption in dopamine with tremors. So it's hard to, it's hard to say, um, if it would be able to impact that whole system, but potentially I would, I would maybe look into that more. I, I don't have a full answer for that one. I've had tinnitus for three years. It's awful. I'd love to try and change that with neuroplasticity change in. Is it actually possible to reduce tinnitus? Yes, it is completely possible to reduce tinnitus. And it, <laughs> I get really bothered when people go to an ENT uh, and their ENT says that it's not um, possible to reduce it because it is. Tinnitus isn't necessarily treatable, like it's not going to go away, but there is lots of tinnitus retraining therapy that you can do where you learn to um, basically interpret the signal as meaningless. Um, so in the same way that you can you know, for example, if you were a machinist and you worked in an environment that was really loud for a long period of time, um, after about a week of working there, your brain just tunes out everything in the background, like all the loud noises, unless there was a noise that was completely new and different, you're probably tuning out that noise. Um, the same thing when you put on a shirt and you wear the shirt for a long time and then the stimulus, you just don't even realize that you, you know, when you first put it, put it on, you could really feel it. So it's kind of like a st stimulus extinguishing therapy. Um, so it can be done in the guidance of a therapist. And you can also just look it up online. There's a lot of podcasts that kind of walk you through how to do it. Um, and there's a lot of YouTube channels that will walk you through how to do it too. Or you can do it with the guidance of a therapist. I also have tinnitus. Um, and it, I, it, again, just like my pain, I've sort of trained myself to not pay attention to it. And every once in a while, I'll notice it. But it is, it used to be like, all the time that I notice it, but it's very, very quiet now. Um, uh, so I know it's possible both personally and from a lot of clients who've had it. But I will say um, you do want to get checked out by an ENT anyways, because sometimes the cause of tinnitus can be structural, right? So sometimes it could be like inflammation or um, some kind of structural thing. So definitely get it checked out. Don't just try and reduce it on your own from the get go. Okay. So this person was just saying that like, basically it works and they've known a lot of people who brain retraining daily has worked for, for reducing symptoms related to chronic fatigue syndrome. So that's great. I'm really glad that you've had that experience and you know, people who have as well. <clears throat> So this one is saying, how do you integrate family? Their family is a two hour drive away, <clears throat> four hour total driving time. You want to see them, but not sure how to do it safely. Um, so yeah, I mean, I guess in this, it's more so about the drive, um, the drive that's causing fatigue. So when we're thinking about introducing something like, like driving without fatigue, you want to start again, really slowly, like 15 minutes maybe build up your tolerance, maybe plan to take lots and lots of breaks while you're driving, plan for it to take more time, maybe plan to meet your family halfway. And also we have lots of great technology, right? Where we can, I know it's not the same as being in person, but where we can meet people over Zoom and things like that. So sometimes it's just a matter of being really creative with the ways that you pace and with the ways that you um, engage with, with things like technology. Mm.
So this person is saying, since COVID, it seems like the principle of use it or lose it becomes inverted. It seems the more I use it, the more I lose it. If I use my brain, I get ringing in the ears, light sound, sensitivity, headache, et cetera, et cetera. Um, lying down will help those symptoms come down until I next try to use my brain. So yeah, so we're not, okay, I want to make sure that we're uh, making it clear that when your symptoms increase like that, it doesn't mean that you're losing your ability to do things necessarily. So you've lost your ability because of the symptoms that are coming on, but not because you've lost the ability in your brain. So I just want to like dispel any fear that you're actually losing your, or your the ability to do those things in your brain. What needs to happen is just pay, like pacing to a degree that is like almost painful. <laughs> I, I, I go through this with my clients a lot where people are like, well, I am pacing. And then we look at what they're doing and it's like, no, we need to take even more breaks and we need to take breaks sooner. And we need to take breaks for a little bit longer and make sure that the breaks are actually restorative. So, um, just dispelling the fear that you're losing your caught, your actual brain function around doing the activities. It's just the symptoms that are making you not be able to do the activities, which is a subtle distinction, but an important one. Um, and really upping the amount that you pace will help you be able to integrate things very slowly. So just think about integrating it as slow as possible. Would neuroplasticity work equally in someone with ADHD? So um, it's a developmental disorder. It's something that you've had since childhood, right? So a lot of the patterns are going to be extremely um, embedded in the brain. Um, but there are lots of ways where we can kind of compensate around the patterns. There's a lot of really good techniques for people with ADHD, like compensatory techniques, scheduling and planners and reminders and all these kinds of things that can really help support it. Um, ADHD comes with a lot of symptoms, so it's hard to comment on the whole disorder, but yes, neuroplasticity is going to work in pretty much any brain. Uh, it, some brains might have a little bit harder of a time, but if you use the principles, you're going to get neuroplasticity one way or another. Again, it's not that it's going to cure anything, but it, it can make it easier to live with. Mm. Recommendations with NAD, neurofeedback and wearable devices to help with brain function. I'm not sure what NAD is, but I did chat about neurofeedback. That's There's neurofeedback. And then our clinic also has something called a shift wave chair which uses um, like vibrations and sounds to um, change the state of your nervous system too. And it's pretty interesting to that chair is, is uh, it's new research, but it's really interesting stuff. Um, my heart rate increases with even minimal amount of exertion and my breathing becomes very restricted. I have been advised by my therapist to start some gentle cycling on a stationary bike. Do you think if I start slowly and continue to do this regularly, it can help, help stabilize my heart rate over time? That depends. I don't know you or your personal situation. Um, so it's kind of hard to say uh, because yes, if you had a concussion, then um, going on a stationary bike and increase would definitely stabilize your heart rate over time. Again, I don't know you, so I don't know your specific situation. Um, with chronic fatigue, it's a little trickier with exercise, right? Um, but yeah, I would just consult your doctors and your healthcare providers because they'll they'll know best about how to treat you in your care. Um... I've been off work for several months now because touching computer or reading something complex also triggers fatigue. I haven't done much of those. Should I still do five minutes even if the activity is cause an energy crash? So no, I wouldn't do five minutes of an activity that causes a crash for you. What I would do is try to simplify it. So for example, you're saying that reading something complex triggers fatigue. Would it be possible to read something incredibly simple? Like could you read a children's book, for example? And I'm not saying that in a way that's like, you know, meant to be demeaning in any, any way, shape or form. Um, when I had my concussion, um, I, the only thing that I could comprehend was Winnie the Pooh. So, and I couldn't even read it. I had to listen to it. So can you listen to something instead of reading it? Can you read very big print um, and something that's much more simple to comprehend? So when we're thinking about breaking down activities, this is why it can be really helpful to work with an OT because you know, we're really good at breaking activities down. But when we're thinking about breaking activities down, 
um, you want to think about all the different ways in which you can simplify that activity. So it doesn't have to be something that completely that you did at work, but just related to it. So even if, you know, reading emails and responding to emails was a part of work, then maybe you ask a friend to send you a super simple email with a super simple question for you to answer and you start there. You know what I mean? So it's like getting creative in the ways which you break things down. Uh, is being uh, neurodiverse, autism, ADHD, more challenging for neuroplasticity? Um, I, I mean, all brains can do neuroplasticity. I have never read anything about if it makes it more challenging or not. Um, I mean, it'd be interesting to read. There's a lot of very complex stuff to do with neuroplasticity that I didn't get into, like the NMDA receptors and, um, you know, the interplay of different chemicals in the brain that helps create neuroplasticity. So, and, the, and BDNF and all these different factors. So it'd be, I think that's actually a really interesting thing that I might just look into for fun. Um, if, if that's different. So thank you for that interesting question. Um, this person was saying that dance and movement are very helpful for a flow state. I completely agree with you. I get into flow states very easily when I'm dancing and it's one of my favorite things to do for, for flow. Um, so this is another very similar question. How do you find the balance between taking a break from work and not looking to engage in anything work related? So again, again, just figuring out thing like thinking about your job thinking about the tasks that you have to do in your job, and then thinking about what's something adjacent enough to that task that it'll feel like I'm practicing it without completely crashing me. What's the smallest amount of thing that I can do? And I know it's not fun to think about work. You can start with things like leisure and things that you actually feel like really passionate about, unless you were very passionate about your job and you really want to think about that too. But thinking about what you were passionate about, um, and then starting there is a really good point. And again, just using those pacing principles as much as possible. Um, so this person's saying, did I understand correctly that you no longer experience pain after training your brain to interpret the signals as meaningless? How is it possible to do this selectively? How is this any different from repressing or dissociating from your experience? It's not dangerous to train your pain to ignore pain signals. So. This is a very complex thing and I, I touched on it quickly. I'm going to get into this in detail. There's, there's going to be two hour long presentations on chronic pain in October. So I'm going to get into it in, in a lot of detail, not just my personal experience, but all the research that I've looked into around pain, but just to give you a little, a little bit of an example of what I mean so that it's more clear. Um, basically what happens with a lot of forms of pain is that we get sensitized to it. So my body says, oh my gosh, there's something really wrong and we need to protect that area and, and all hands on deck, something is wrong, right? And that's happening subconsciously. It's basically the fear center in the brain saying, you know, we need to protect this area, produce more pain. This is like gonna be hard to understand if you don't understand all the pain science. So please come to those lectures if you're more interested in this. Um, but basically what's happened is that my body's very sensitized. The, the threshold for pain is low. And so what I did was just can try to convince myself over and over, like I'm actually safe. You know, this isn't, there isn't a danger in this area. Pain is just protection and I don't need to be protected right now. And convincing my body that I was safe because I was, because there wasn't in that moment, like a threat of actual danger of me actually injuring myself anymore because my, you know, there was no, like, there was nothing there that was going to make it any worse. Um, convincing myself of that over time just allowed me to realize that I don't need that protection in that area anymore. So that's just a very quick, as quick as I could do <laughs> um, explanation of it, but it will make a lot more sense if you come to those lectures in the fall. <laughs> Um, because they're literally two hours filled with me explaining that in a much more round way than I just did. Um, for scattered brain fog, forgetfulness, how to re retrain the, the brain flow to be focused on what we want it to. So it's really just a matter. I mean, meditation is a great place to start because you're focusing on one 
point of attention and you're redirecting your brain over and over again, every time it becomes not focused, but also throughout your day, if you notice that you're starting to drift, you can kind of use those same meditation principles and be like, oh, I noticed my thoughts are starting to drift. And then you bring it back to paying attention to what you were paying attention to without judging yourself for it drifting. Um, so I think if you're, if you have a good meditation practice where you're doing it frequently, then it bleeds into other things in your life. And you can actually kind of use those same principles and other things in your life. It's just a matter of training your brain to actually catch when you're, when you're um, starting to flow off and being able to do that um, can be as simple as just getting the intention that, okay, I really want to catch it when my brain starts to wander and having that intention can help you do it. Um, so in terms of the supplements, yeah, I can mention a few. Omega-3 is a really good supplement for the brain. Um, magnesium, great supplement for the brain. Ginkgo biloba, um, L-glutathione, um, again, with supplements, it's not really within my jurisdiction to be able to recommend supplements. So, um, talk to your doctor or pharmacist about supplements, or, um, you can also look them up online. There's plenty of resources out there. Um, or if you are seeing Dr. Arsenault already, I'm sure he'd be happy to talk to you about supplements as well. So someone was just giving some information that there is legal access to psilocybin via, via special health Canada application and some therapists trained to do it. So that's great. I didn't even know that we've come that far. So that's awesome. So when you speak about pain in this lecture, can I substitute fatigue in place of pain? Fatigue is more my primary symptom over pain. Um, fatigue is a little bit different than pain, um, but we can still fatigue can be compounded by that amygdala activation. Um, so we can still train the brain to reduce it, but there's also so many other things going on, right? Um, there can be the mast cell act activation, or there can be sort of like a downward effect from the virus that you had that's affecting your cells in different ways. So there's a lot of different like physiological things that are happening with fatigue. That doesn't mean that we can't reduce the fatigue and we can't get more out of our nervous systems with a regulated nervous system. So um, I'd recommend going back and watching the rewiring your nervous system PowerPoint that is on the YouTube channel because that will be really helpful for um, reducing fatigue, I think. Are meaningful activities something we enjoy? Yeah, exactly. Something that's meaningful to you. So in any activity that is to you that means something, it doesn't necessarily have to be something you enjoy. It's just something that holds a lot of meaning. So for example, um, I don't necessarily enjoy doing the dishes, but to me, it's meaningful that I can do them physically because I can keep my house clean um, and I can keep my roommates happy. So it doesn't necessarily have to be something you enjoy. It's just something that holds meaning. Can I elaborate on cold exposure? Yeah, so um, cold exposure can be good for regulating the nervous system. Um, some people take cold showers in the morning um, or they you know, jump into a cold lake or ocean as long as it's not too cold because you don't want to give yourself hypothermia. Um, but it's a, what we call hormetic stress. It's a type of good stress for the nervous system and it can help us to relate to stress better. So if you know, I say, go take a cold shower right now. And your response is, I would not do that. Absolutely no way. That can tell us a lot about how we respond to stress. Cause then I'd be like, go into a stressful situation. And you're like, absolutely not, no way. But if we train ourselves to approach stress differently, then um, that can train the nervous system. With hormetic stress, so things like sauna, HIIT workouts, and cold exposure, um, there's mixed reviews with people with chronic fatigue syndrome. Sometimes it makes them feel worse. So I would listen to your own body and experiment with your healthcare practitioners around something like that. You will be getting the presentation slides, yes. And the recording will be on the YouTube channel. So this person's saying they want to improve their day-to-day -day memory. So remembering conversations with important people, remembering what I'm doing when I'm leaving the room, remembering to eat and drink. How do you start? So 
again, we want to think about the activity that you want to do. So you've identified that you want to improve your memory. One of the components of that, so you've already done a great job at, at breaking this down, right? One of the components of that is remembering conversations with important people. So what you could do is, um, for example, a very functional activity would be listening to conversations. So maybe listening to a podcast or listening to um, a, a snippet of a TV show on YouTube or something like that, and then pausing it and then relay, either writing down or relaying back as much as you can about what you just heard in that conversation. Um, and that's a direct like analog to what you, what you're trying to work on. Right. So then you repeat that over and over again and you do it to your tolerance, right? Like you have a, probably a lot of things going on in your life. You have other therapy you have to work on. So you fit it in however much makes sense for your life. The more that you repeat it, the better. If you could do it every day, all day, you'd probably um, be able to change your brain quicker. But, you know, our energy limitations, our other things that we're doing in life get in the way of that. So just as much as you can uh, in terms of frequency. Uh, and resources for learning about deep rest meditation. Um, so yeah, I would look up non-sleep deep rest on YouTube. Um, or yoga nidra. Um, or if you want, there's an app called insight timer and you can kind of play around. There's hundreds of meditations. You, uh, a lot of people say they don't like meditating, but what I think is that it's probably that you've maybe just tried one that wasn't well suited for you and your brain. Um, so I think if you, if you play around with meditation, you can get to one where it's actually, you know, you actually like it. Like maybe you're visualizing something instead of focusing on breath, or maybe you're, um, you know, squeezing and releasing your muscles instead of just thinking about a candle in front of you or whatever it is. So finding the one that works for you can be really beneficial. Um, and this other question is just about um, having difficulty and being conscious of internal sensations and experiences. So yeah, when we're building interoception, so a lot of people don't have very good interoception, meaning um, the ability to feel what's happening within your body. When we're building interoception, you want to start with things that are most obvious. So when you're really hungry, notice what does it feel like to be hungry, right? Or you can cause a sensation. So for example, I could press my thumb into my, my, my palm and as I do sort of gently pressing my thumb into my palm, at what point do I really feel that pressure? And at what, and what does that pressure feel like? And how far around can I feel that pressure? And when I take my hand away, do I still feel that pressure? So you can build up your interoception with neuroplasticity by practicing with things that are a little bit bigger and then slowly making it smaller. Do I offer hypnosis virtually? Yes, I do. I, I offer all my services virtually. Uh, this person asked if I can recommend EMDR psychologists. I don't know any personally, but um, if you go on psychology today and you type in EMDR, there'll be several that have um, that designation. There's also a really great um, counseling service called No Fear. And if you call them, they can um, pair you with an EMDR uh, psychologist or, or counselor. Um, um, an example of a neuroplasticity exercise for a moment of anxiety. So anxiety is fear, right? And if we're feeling fear, we're feeling unsafe. So if we're in a moment of anxiety, we might want to ground ourselves with something that makes us feel safe. You could do a breathing exercise that activates your parasympathetic nervous system. So like um, the physiological sigh, for example, it's a quick, two quick inhales and a long exhale that will help to engage the parasympathetic nervous system. Or you could imagine something that helps you to feel safe. So you could imagine, like I said earlier, like Falcor, you could imagine um, something spiritual. You could imagine yourself on a beach and you feel really safe there. Um, those kinds of things will help to train the brain to feel more safe in those moments of anxiety. Um, okay, I talked about supplements. This person said, I've seen some neuroplasticity courses online. Is there a particular online program you would recommend? I've never done an online program. Um, all my information has come just from, from research and, um, and from school, from taking neuroscience in school. 
uh, I don't really know about the courses out there. Um, neuroplasticity just means changing your brain. So it can mean a lot of things. I would be wary of some of the courses out there just because I think some of them are using very basic principles. Like some of the ones I've looked at online are using very basic principles and then charging a lot of money for them. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure about that, but just, I would kind of rewatch some of the rewiring the nervous system and, and things like that, um, that I've done. Cause that again, kind of talks about this whole concept a little bit more, but if you do find a good course, let me know. Cause I'd be really interested to see a good one. Mm. Lots of thank yous. You're welcome. <laughs> uh... So this is a more specific question about the psychedelics. I don't really feel comfortable answering that just because it's kind of still on the legal fence and um, I don't actually know. Um, but there are, I'm sure when you kind of Google it and look into it, you can find therapists that would be willing to have those conversations with you. All my appointments are online. Just another uh, question about that. So the, the, this person's asking, how do you access the $15 classes? Um, so what I'm going to be doing is make, I'm going to send out an email with all the classes, probably when I get back from vacation. So probably mid September, uh, and that email will come through Bruno again. So, um, you'll have access to all the classes for the next mm, probably six months and you can sign up for whatever ones you want. Okay. So this person was, there's a lot of questions about ADHD. It makes me wonder if I should do a presentation on ADHD. <laughs> um, I do know a lot about it, so I could. Um, habit building tips for patients who have ADHD as it makes repetition and habit forming extra difficult. Um, yeah, there's a really good book called Atomic Habits. And you can listen to the um, audio book or you can look up um, summaries of it. It has many, many good tips about how to build habits. Um, some of them include habit stacking. So if you're trying to build a habit, pairing it with something that you already do. So for example, if you're trying to do affirmations every day, maybe pairing it with brushing your teeth. So when you're brushing your teeth, you do your affirmations. That's, that's one good example from the book, but I recommend checking out that book because it has a lot of great examples for, um, habit forming. Um... Um, there's some specific medical questions that I don't think I can answer. So someone was asking about uh, taking supplements, using a neurofeedback tool, taking ketamine and other things while working on neuroplasticity help with the process. And if so, why? So, um, they said BDNF pills. So there, there isn't a BDNF pill. I wish there was, that would be really cool. <laughs> um, BDNF is produced when you exercise. Uh, and I'm sure there are other things that can produce it, but exercise is the main one. Um, brain derived neurotropic fa factor. Um, so yes, exercising supplements, neurofeedback, um, these kinds of things will help boost the neuro neuroplasticity because it's basically making your brain more neuroplastic. So um, we didn't get into the nitty gritty of the science of neuroplasticity, but basically there are things that can help enhance the neuroplasticity of your brain. So if you think about Play-Doh um, and you're trying to make a beautiful sculpture, um, making it more wet will make it easier to mold, right? So um, there are certain things we can do to the brain to make it more moldable and some of those include the things like exercise and neurofeedback and, um, and, and supplements and, and those and diet and sleep and those kinds of things that we listed earlier. Um, yes. Um, it is a lot of, it is a lot of information. So with these, that's why these are recorded so that you can, um, if you need to take a break at any time, you can pause. Usually I'll take a break halfway through. I'm sorry, I didn't do that this time. 
So this person again is asking about pain. Um, I will let you know to go check out those pain, the pain talks that I'm going to be doing in October. <laughs>